Hi, I'm Tori, and today I'm going to be discussing The Raven Boys and the Dream Thieves by Maggie Steve Otter. These are the first two books in the Raven Cycle series, and I listened to the audiobooks narrated by Will Patton. So I enjoyed these books a lot, and the audiobooks are really fun because at the end of the books there will be a tiny bit of music that was actually composed by the author, and that adds a nice little bit of ambiance to the stories. These are very fun, mystical fantasy books set in a very quirky, small town, and if you want to read them, I recommend that you go do that and then come back to hear my opinions. So I enjoyed these books a lot. It took me a little bit of time to kind of get situated in the world. First of all, the narrator is Will Patton, who sounds like this very kind of grizzled middle-aged man, and the book opens from Blue's perspective. So hearing this weathered cowboy voice narrating for a 16-year-old girl took me a minute to get used to, but after I kind of got acclimated, I really enjoyed it. You know, he doesn't just narrate for her. The book jumps from perspective to perspective, and his voice really does go very well with the mysterious feeling of the story. It just took me a second to get used to it. It also took me a little while to get used to it because I have also read Maggie Steve Otter's Shiver series, and that is a book about werewolves. And so for some reason, I have no idea why, I was expecting this book to basically be about were ravens, which makes no sense because she already did a were animal story and she's done with that. And so of course she wouldn't make this be basically the exact same series again. I don't know why I thought that, but I was expecting it to be about a bunch of boys who turned into ravens. And so I was kind of surprised it was just a bunch of boarding school boys who are pretty ordinary, at least they seem that way at first. So I think my favorite thing about these books is the just general tone. You know, this setting is so vivid and the characters are so vivid. I love Blue's house that's just crammed full of people and the whole town of Henrietta just seems so vivid and so alive and I love that. I love it that every single person in Blue's family besides her is a psychic. I like the dynamic that we know right from the beginning that Blue is either going to fall in love with Gansey or kill him, probably both. And so then it's really interesting that she starts out dating Adam and that she really doesn't like Gansey and she doesn't want to fall in love with him, partly because she wants to have free will and partly because she genuinely doesn't like him at first. It kind of reminded me in the TV series Boys Over Flowers. You go into the series knowing that the girl is going to end up with one of the boys in the group, but she starts out kind of being brought into the group by a different boy. So it was the same sort of dynamic going on. When I first started reading the book, I was a little overwhelmed by all the characters. There are so many people in Blue's house, and at first I had a hard time telling. I wasn't sure if it was just her mother and Persephone and Callow, or if there were dozens more. It took me a minute to kind of get my bearings there. And then the group of Raven Boys felt like a lot too. And so I was a little annoyed by that, by being overwhelmed by all these characters, not really paying attention to who they were and not really being able to get a good grasp on who anyone was. It was just you had people coming at you and you'd hear their names and I wasn't quite sure who was associated with that name. And at first I was a little annoyed by that and I felt like it was a flaw in the writing until we get to the part where we find out that Noah is dead and Gansey starts asking all these questions. How did we meet Noah? Have we ever seen him in class? Um, why is he always so kind of faded off into the background? And then this writing style seems so brilliant because it makes so much sense. He is just kind of this background character who just kind of shows up in people's lives. And he's not this super established, grounded person like everybody else. But because of all the chaos of all the characters, you didn't notice that. And you can see why Blue wouldn't notice it and why the boys wouldn't notice it. And it's just the perfect twist because it makes perfect sense once you find out about it. But there's no way you could have seen it coming. I loved the general feeling of Blue's upbringing with all the psychics and all the, oh yeah, we're so used to doing readings and Blue's just gonna power stuff and that's how things go and it seems so quirky and so matter of fact at the same time and that's just the perfect blend. I really love during the climactic scene at the end of the first book that Adam realizes that he can be the sacrifice. No one has to die to make a sacrifice and wake the ley line. Everyone just heard the word sacrifice and assumed they needed to kill somebody. But they don't. There are lots of things you can sacrifice and lots of parts of yourself that can matter and that you can give up for something that's important. And I just thought that was really interesting. And then the very ending of the first book caught me a little off guard because Ronan has had Chainsaw, his little baby bird, throughout the whole book. And I'm like, okay, Ronan is like the 
big, tough, scary guy with this little bird, and that's so cute. And you don't really think too much about it. And then he's like, oh, I brought Chainsaw out of my dreams. And I was caught off guard by that a little bit because I wasn't quite sure if it was a metaphor, if it had really happened, because we do know that there is magic in this world, definitely. We're spending the whole book doing magical things, but it's a very subtle kind of magic. And this is such a big tangible thing. And so usually I stop and like let a book marinate for a little bit, but I just ran right into the second book. And the second book gets so much more magical. And Ronan is so much more of a main character in this book. In the first book, you know, he's just sort of there. We don't see inside his head, which makes sense because inside his head is a really magical place and we haven't realized how magical the world is until the second book. And so it's so cool in the Dream Thieves to watch him and see how crazy magical his life is and all the things he's able to pull out of his dreams and watch his rivalry with Kaminsky. And it was so great to just kind of get to know Ronan and get to see him struggling to kind of control his powers and also see Adam struggling to control his new powers now that he is so linked to the ley line. It felt like the whole second book was mostly about characters getting to know themselves. Plot-wise, not a whole lot happened. There were some plot developments, but mostly it was just about people discovering who they were and getting comfortable with themselves and with each other. And I love that so much. I loved Mr. Gray. He's a dangerous assassin. You know that from the beginning. You've seen him kill people. You've seen him beat up characters we know. You've seen what a horrible person he can be. And then watching him show up to Blue's house and just seeing Mora and Persephone and Kala just chatting with him and inviting him in. And then pretty soon Mora starts dating him. And it's just so great. I love stories like that. I love it when we have an assassin who is still a very dangerous person, but is also human. And everyone's just like, oh yeah, he's dangerous and he could probably kill us, but I don't think he will. I'm gonna go ahead. And they're, like, Mora isn't stupid. She definitely treats him with caution, but she actually kind of likes it that he's an assassin. And their whole relationship was just so much fun. It was interesting to follow Blue's love life in this book. Basically, from the beginning of the book, she and Adam were in the process of breaking up because she was developing feelings for Gansey and Adam was a different person. It was just not going to last. And they spent basically the whole book sort of breaking up. And so it's good to that it's just over and done with. And, you know, throughout the whole book, she is kind of developing feelings for Gansey and he is developing feelings for her and you kind of watch them falling in love. And, you know, you have that whole scene at the end where they um, finally confront their feelings for each other after she's broken up with Adam. And they have this one moment with the almost kiss where Gansey knows that she can't kiss him. But they have this wonderful moment of pretending. And also I love the scene with Blue and Noah where they kiss. So Blue actually does get a first kiss because, you know, she's gone her whole life thinking she'll never kiss anybody because she doesn't want to accidentally kill her true love. And Noah says, hey, I'm already dead. Why don't you just kiss me? And it was so much fun. And it was seeing them kind of wishing that they could date, you know, just because they are both each other's only option. And it was really interesting. I was feeling almost like Blue was just going to end up dating the entire posse of Raven Boys and she was just going to go out with all of them. And I was starting to wonder at one point if she was going to go for Ronan too. But we find out that he is interested in Adam and I love that so much. I loved it from the moment that Ronan's brother comes into the car and sees Ronan lounging there and looks at Ronan's leg draped across Adam's and is very horrified by that. And you're thinking, oh, maybe something's going on. And then at the end, you find out that Ronan is developing feelings for Adam, which is perfect because Ronan is definitely the darkest, most angry, conflicted character in the book. And Adam was the super sweet one, but now that he's been dealing with all of these ley line powers and stuff, he's gotten a little bit more of an edge to him. And I think he and Ronan would be a really good fit. And they've also both been kind of developing powers. You know, throughout this whole book, Ronan is struggling with his nightmares that keep escaping his dreams and trying to learn how to control his dreams. And Kaminsky teaches him how to control his dreams, but then he realizes he's killing the ley line. So then he learns how to work with the ley line and be much more careful and respectful of it and not brutalize it and that was really cool and kind of he learns that all of his problems were just in his head and he can control it and Adam kind of goes on the same journey because he's having all these problems where he's like blacking out and not knowing what to do and then he realizes that the ley line is just trying to talk to him and if he just listens and is aware of it then he doesn't have these problems it was so great because this book felt like it was mostly about characters dealing with problems that felt like they were insurmountable until they realized that they'd just been creating those problems for themselves and they didn't really have anything to worry about 
And so it'll be really interesting to see what happens in the next book. Because, you know, the first book was all about waking the ley line, and the second book was figuring out why the ley line was being so weird and what to do now. And it feels like the next book should be a lot about plot, and now the characters are all much more comfortable with themselves, and they've done a lot of soul searching. So now it's time to go try to find Glendower, and I can't wait to see how that is all going to turn out.